Hi, I'm Kevin Stiles, interpreter at Dickey Ridge Visitor Center. As you walk through the woods of Shenandoah National Park, you may think of it as just a nice walk through the same woods throughout. But as you go up and down in elevation, you may begin to notice things are a little bit more complex. The plants and animals will vary due to a number of factors as you go up and down. In many ways, Shenandoah is a number of ecosystems stacked on top of one another. And as you go up and the climate begins to get cooler, in some ways it's like traveling north. Beauty and diversity await all those who make the journey. And if we all do our part, we can preserve that beauty for future generations. So how does biodiversity and ecology change with elevation? Well, the biggest factor is climate. Now what comes to mind when I say the word climate? Probably for most of us, it's temperature. And the temperature does change with elevation in ways that are usually pretty standard. Here in temperate latitudinal mountains, that is mountains this, about this far away from the equator, maybe a bit further south, maybe a bit further north, you are going to get about one degree Fahrenheit difference for every 300 feet up you go. So for instance, our headquarters located near Luray, Virginia is at about 1100 feet above sea level. Now, if you were to visit the highest peak in the park, Hawksbill, you'd be at about 4,000. That's a change of almost 3000 feet. So you'd expect about 10 degrees difference in temperature. Now that difference in temperature can affect something called phenology. Phenology is just a fancy way of saying how the different things come, or rather, how those things uh, go through their various life stages. If you've ever been up on the mountain during fall, you've seen that in action, as the different levels of the mountains go through their fall colors at different times. But it can also affect when the animals give birth their young, or when berries and flowers come out in the plants. Why does that uh, temperature change so much? Well, another thing that changes with elevation is air pressure. As you go up the mountain, the air gets less thick, and as a result, it's less able to trap heat. All these effect, uh, factors will affect other things, parts of climate, such as precipitation. Precipitation up in the mountains is generally speaking going to be a little bit greater the farther up the mountain you go for various reasons like orographic lifting, which causes moisture to get cooler as it moves up the side of a mountain. Finally, all these factors are going to uh, change something called biomass. Biomass is just another way of saying how much something grows in a given area. So all these plants contribute to the biomass of the area. So what does that look like at Shenandoah? Well, we are what is known as a series of microclimates. The different elevations leads to slightly different climates all throughout the mountain. Also a number of other factors affect those. Now, the biggest contributor to our precipitation is going to be the currents of the Gulf Stream. We're going to get a lot of moisture coming off that ocean with a westerly wind. As it comes up the east side here, it's going to deposit a lot of rain, more so than you expect in the Piedmont, in areas like, say, Charlottesville. As it moves up the mountain, the air is going to get cooler, it's going to deposit more moisture, and it actually leaves behind a little bit of a rain shadow for the Shenandoah Valley. So we are going to get the most moisture, after that is going to be the Piedmont, and then finally the Shenandoah Valley gets the least. Now, because of various factors, the air currents from the Gulf Stream and others, we haven't actually seen effects of climate change. So after climate, one of the biggest factors is landscape. How does landscape affect it? Well, the first one is area. As you go higher and higher up the mountain, there's less and less area. That means less space for competition, less space for prey to hide from predators, and less space to just roam around and forage. So some animals are not able to make use of that space and have to exist further down the mountain. You might also see the soil quality degrade as you go higher up, which may not be able to support all the plants and animal needs, and therefore they are not able to survive. Another factor is productivity. As we uh, move throughout the uh, forest, you're going to see a very productive 
a very hardy and very resilient forest. A number of changes already taken place here and more are to come as various things like climate change come to pass. But overall, our productivity hasn't seen a, a big drop. Finally, there's one other factor that affects uh, the forest ecology. That's us. Humans have had a tremendous impact whenever, wherever we go, and Shenandoah National Park is no exception. Throughout the uh, 19th and into the 20th century, copper and other products were mined here. Now, those mining productions weren't exactly big on safety sometimes, so they would have fires. These fires burned the natural forests, and so xeric, or plants that do well after a fire, started to take their place, giving us more things like oak. We've also either extirpated from this area, which is completely removed, or driven species to extinction. In the early uh, 18th century, we would have had elk and bison here, but they were both gone by the mid 19th century. The passenger pigeon was one bird that was here that's gone completely extinct. And one last thing is we can introduce things that haven't been here before. Invasive species like the woolly adalgid or the emerald ash borer have been changing the uh, ecosystem for many years. In the early 19th century, local uh, chestnut growers were hoping to improve the stock of their trees. So they brought over trees from China. Those Chinese trees brought with them a chestnut blight, which unfortunately has driven our chestnut to extinction. So we've got an idea of how ecology affects the mountain. Let's see that in action. When you go through the entrance station, you've actually ascended a lot of the mountain and you've passed by a lot of the levels. The park starts, of course, at the boundary. And at the lower levels, you're going to see a lot of border species. So for instance, the red fox. The red fox doesn't like a completely covered forest floor like this. It prefers to have a little bit more open space. And so it might come in between the boundary area. As you head up into the proper eastern woodlands, you'll notice a lot of creatures. Those creatures, of course, like to feast on plants that grow on the forest floor. These plants have to be shade uh, tolerant. That is that they have to be able to survive without a ton of direct sunlight as they may not get some throughout most or even the whole day. Plants like the white snake root, flowering plants like the azalea or the columbine, and berry producing plants like the wineberry plant. All of these are things that uh, animals like to eat uh, when they're here. They also like to eat other smaller animals like amphibians. Amphibians. Amphibians are need, uh, need a lot of water. Why would they grow on the forest floor? Thanks to the shade and various things like decomposing logs and areas that's actually quite moist. And so we have a lot of redback salamanders and other amphibians. Those redback salamanders are actually an important part of the ecosystem, serving as food for animals like uh, the rack or like the possum and sometimes larger predators like the bobcat. Redback salamanders and other amphibians are actually so common that in any given square mile of the park, their biomass is going to be more than, say, a mammal like a bear or a deer. As you move a little bit further up the food chain, you, of course, also have eastern cottontail rabbits. They're spread throughout the United States, the eastern part at least, and they're actually going to be on the mountain, though they only usually come up to about 2,500 feet. You also have other mammals like deer. Deer, of course, need a lot of space, as I mentioned earlier. Deer can eat as much as a ton of plant mass over the course of a year. So they're going to need a lot of area with which to move about and eat. Now, as you're walking the trails, you may hear a gobble gobble. Is that a ghost? No, it's a poultry geist. Turkeys, of course, roam the forest floor, and they're going to uh, be needing a lot of space in which to hunt and gather. Now, as you're walking along, you may also hear a rattle. We actually have a couple different uh, forms of venomous snake here in the park. One here is going to be the timber rattler. Timber rattlers will go up trees or mainly roam around the forest floor. Remember, if you're trying to figure out how big a timber rattler is, always measure his inches. They don't have any feet. <laughs> Sorry. And finally, you may see lots of species of bird. You may hear the rat-a-tat-tat of a woodpecker as it tries to get uh, various insects from the trees. You may hear, or probably won't, an owl as it glides around trying to snatch its prey. 
The trees themselves uh, serve as a valuable source of food, as well as shelter for many animals. These include pines, uh, as well as some of the xeric trees like maple, oak, and birch that grow throughout the area. As we move up into the higher elevations, we begin to transition from the eastern woodlands to boulder fields and talus slopes and other communities you expect to find at higher elevations. The space is lessened, so you're starting to see less and less big creatures like the bear and the deer, and you're starting to see creatures whose uh, climate, or rather their habitat, is based on climate. So for instance, down near the bottom, you would expect to find the eastern cottontail rabbit. But as you get above 2,500 feet, you start to see more and more Appalachian cottontail rabbits. If you were to come to this area during the spring, you would expect to see snakes all up and down. But if you were coming in winter, you would find the snakes, not find snakes at this elevation, as they need to go lower when they den. You also might see some different predators, like bobcats. Bobcats, generally speaking, like to stay above 2,500 feet, though they will emerge a little bit lower if need be. And as we continue to go up higher and higher, we're going to see a community that is shaped more and more by those changes in elevation. We have now reached the boulder fields. And although they only they take up less than 5% of park land, they hold an abundance of wildlife only found here. For instance, bats love the higher elevation. And the pygmy bat is usually found around this area. The peregrine falcon uses these cliffs in order to uh, nest and practice their diving. In fact, here at Shenandoah National Park, we have a program to help foster and reintroduce peregrine falcons that are found in dangerous spots. Lots of plants thrive really only at this elevation, like the bearberry and the thymoleaf sandwort. These plants support a very fragile ecosystem. And you have uh, creatures like the Shando salamander that are trapped here. Back thousands of years ago, there was glaciation in the area. Now it only stopped as far as Pennsylvania, but that climate still affected our area. And so if you remember, we have different landscapes stacked on top of one another. The only place where the air and uh, conditions are cool enough for the Shando salamander to exist are at the very top of the mountain. And so, in many ways, they're trapped. As the most delicate ecosystems, areas like the boulder field and the talus slope are going to be the ones most affected by change. And there is drastic change coming to the park. One of them is something we have to all work together for, and that's climate change. Climate change has a massive impact on the area. Now, climate change actually hasn't had a big effect on Shenandoah yet. Uh, thanks to things like the Gulf Stream and air currents, we haven't felt the worst effects yet. But we are seeing changes. We have more cloud cover now than we ever have before. And our precipitation is slightly up. We're also starting to see invasive species in the area, and those invasive species are helped by warmer conditions as they're able to head further and further up the mountain. You also have um, various plants slowly, over the course of many generations, start to migrate up the slope as they try to reach areas that are their preferred temperature. Finally, you have species that are starting to migrate and move as they are unable to find the plants and food they need or just simply can't stand the climate. We expect some bird migrations to shift northward and we expect some rodent species to become completely extirpated or removed from the area, while others begin to move in and take their place. The Shenandoah salamander and others that are confined to the hide areas, however, have no place to go. And so the worry is that as the climate starts to warm, they will begin to be extirpated and even go extinct. And as we get uh, warmer temperatures, we also get more trans evaporation, which is the water beginning to be drained from the soil, making it slightly drier. And you also get species of animal that have their phenology changed. That means their creatures, and remember, are born a little bit later or a little bit earlier. Other uh, plants that don't like the heat are like these lichen right here. These lichen prefer to be dry and crispy, but if it gets a little bit too dry and crispy, they're not able to survive. Climate change is a large problem that we're all gonna have to work together to fix. 
But if you're in the park, there are small things that you can do to help us keep the wildlife and uh, fragile areas like this safe. One of them is follow the rules of romp. What's romp? Romp is what we call our Rocky Outcropping Management Plan. Back in the early 2000s, Shenandoah National Park realized that a lot of our mountainous areas were being affected by human population and traffic. They did a study of over 50 sites and found that over 90% of them showed impacts from humans, and uh, quite a few of those had significant damage. So, after many years of study and consulting with the public, the park decided to protect certain areas a little bit more than they had uh, previously. And though these sections uh, only protect less than 2% of the park surface, or less than 2% of the park area, they account for a number of species. You remember I referenced the lichen earlier? Well, when they are dry and crispy, they are incredibly delicate and can be damaged by people stepping on them. In fact, the, when I and the cameraman came here to this spot, I had to spend several uh, minutes planning to make sure that we weren't stepping on anything too delicate. What does romp entail? Well, for you as a visitor, it just means following a few simple directions. When you come up a path, if you see a sign, please respect what it says. No camping above certain elevations. Try to stick to the trail and use social trails as little as possible. In certain very high-use areas, such as Hawksbill or Old Rag, we've set up barriers. Please respect those. As you walk through the National Park, you go through a journey through the woods. But those woods change as we get higher and higher. As you've hopefully learned throughout this program, these changes can be uh, anything from very subtle to very drastic. And these changes reflect the biodiversity of the park. Now, these changes are, can be fragile and we all need to do our part to protect it. Our journey today has taken us through many different levels of the mountain, and we've seen that this place isn't just a gentle walk through the woods. As we make our journey up through the elevations, we see different areas of biodiversity affected by different factors, all tied to elevation. These factors, like climate and space, allow us to have a very diverse ecosystem, but we need to protect that ecosystem, whether it be from climate change or just simply following a few rules of romp. So please, as you're hiking today, remember, stay on trail, respect signs, and respect our ecosystems. And we'll all be romping through the national parks and have a happy hike today. Thank you for joining me. My name has been Kevin Stiles. Hope you enjoyed the program. Bye-bye.